Uh, our speaker today is Rick Anderson. After studying natural resource management in Wis Michigan and Wisconsin, Rick moved to Missouri in 1980 to join the Missouri Department of Natural Resources. After a two-year tour of duty at the Missouri DNR Public Information Office, Rick served as a budget officer until 1994. Since moving to DNR's Energy Center, Rick has been involved in energy policy issues. Current duties focus on renewable energy with specific emphasis on wind energy, and I think that's what he's going to speak to us about today. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, again, I'm with Natural Resources, and uh, <clears throat> the topic that I was asked to address is energy and the environment, and that's that's pretty big. So um, I'm going to I'm going to take kind of a big picture tour of that. If you would uh, move to the next slide, please. <coughs> yeah, that's right. Well, maybe, I guess it's the one at the bottom. I'm going to have to mouse it and. Um, Okay, we're going to follow this five-step outline, and I'll uh, I'll take you to this this outline slide as we move through that, so you kind of see where we are and see where we're going. <coughs> um, really, slides four and five I think are going to be the ones that are most um, content. I'm I'm going to survey the um, essentially where the process of of working with energy it has an impact on our environment. If you'd go ahead, please. Just tap on that on that space you're on, I think. Okay. We'll, and I think this thing has some sort of weird toggle that you have to reveal. But it, uh, when you go through it, it, if it has you do little prompts to keep it moving, we'll learn together. Um, we, just a kind of a quick picture. Uh, across the top are various technologies, coal or, or energy sources, coal, oil, natural gas, hydro, wind, solar biomass, and then take a look at uh, which ones have a significant impact on land productivity and erosion, water quality and quantity, visual intrusion, and flora and fauna. Again, really broad brush. Clearly, um, the fossil fuels on the left have some of the most um, intersections with uh, those environmental issues. Hydro um, doesn't uh, have the visual intrusion. Many folks would probably see it as a positive because it's the lakefront. But conversely, it probably has the, the greatest impact on water quality. Um, a lot of folks uh, see wind as a, uh, a desirable visual because it symbolizes something. But there's plenty of folks who find it very offensive. And so uh, I've, I've labeled it as a visual intrusion. And we're hearing from folks that are concerned about uh, the uh, impact on sensitive species, such as the prairie chicken. Uh, solar may have some impacts. I guess it depends on the scale. If it's rooftop, it's probably not important. If it's uh, hundreds of acres, uh, it might be. And then um, biomass, um, it's an agricultural activity, so it, it's going to be similar to uh, our others. We'll go on to the next slide, please. And uh, so if we've, if we've done something to capture the fuel or the energy, the next step would be we're going to get it to people. And a lot of things happen that involve the environment on the way to getting it to people. Go ahead. Uh, we've got uh, four points here. Um, we lose land uh, as we uh, set aside space for our um, transportation corridors, whether those are our roads, the rail lines, uh, pipelines, transmission lines. And then the lines themselves, typically there's some sort of earth disturbance. There's often a lot of uh, um, erosion associated with these man-made uh, linear intrusions. Um, I think most folks are uh, uh, concerned about the um, air emissions. I'm going to address air emissions both as a processing, and I'm going to address it as the third point of, of end user. If it's, uh, if it's being generated into electricity, it's processing, and it's going to be end user when it gets to the resident. But if the coal is being, or, or natural gas is uh, being delivered to the end user and burned there, uh, it's going to show up there. So there's going to be a redundancy because it can be either way. Um, air emissions are a real big issue. <coughs> the the, the, condition, the um, standard parameters that people look at are particulate matter, volatile organics, nitrous oxides, sulfur oxides, carbon monoxide, and one that uh, I think a lot of folks are, are starting to take seriously is carbon dioxide. 
Uh, and then, of course, mercury and a variety of other toxins that are associated with uh, the burning of, of the fuels. Water quality and quantity and, um, and, and spill impacts. Uh, classics would be like uh, the Prince uh, or the, the Alaskan spill. But then uh, many hundreds of spills happen on a, on a daily basis that we don't hear about, but they may not be of epic scale. Go ahead, please. So we'll talk a little bit now about, go ahead, about direct impacts. And, uh, and again, we, we recovered the air, water, uh, but we have waste disposal issues. We have flora and fauna uh, as we uh, warm things up or uh, we discharge things. We're, we're changing the uh, um, environment for plants and animals. And then um, I went so far as to include the environment as uh, noise and light. Uh, friends who are astronomers point out that if lights aren't directed downwards um, and you're trying to see the night sky, uh, that's an environmental issue that they're quite concerned about. Go ahead. Um, so get to indirect impacts. I'm going to talk a little more here and let's move on. Then I think something that's often overlooked as we think about impacts is obviously there's a lot of consequences, undesired outcomes of energy use. And uh, what we're hearing on uh, our, our balance of trade payments, uh, what's happening to the quality of our cities in the air quality, what's happening in, in global warming. But there's some really profound things going on that's very, very big environmental issue and uh, that people are more literate, that people have um, more opportunities to have clean water, they have more opportunities to uh, have medicines brought to them. Those things, I think, are really, really um, mega issues that, as we look at energy, we need to keep that in focus because we've got very strong reasons why we want them. This would be a very dark place without the electricity on, and it probably would be uncomfortable because it uh, wouldn't be the 75 or 6 degrees that we find so comfortable, and our food might not have been warmed. And so, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of benefits of electricity and energy that we sometimes uh, overlook as we, we say, we, we want to trim it, but we also need to uh, appreciate what it does. Over time, there's, there may be a change in population uh, that mitigates it, but clearly since, uh, since we saw the fossil fuel era, um, population has grown at rates that um, I can't imagine could have happened if it were not that we had uh, major um, major energy resources, and those energy resources have thereby made it possible to uh, have more people survive and, a, and an ever larger population. Um, that's really good for all of us on the planet, and it's maybe really bad for the generations ahead unless we figure out how to turn that uh, about or uh, hold even. Um, and there's probably as many philosophies on that as there are people in the room, so I'll, I'll, I'll just leave at that. Uh, it's clear that species diversity uh, is a is a uh, indirect impact. We've plenty of other folks have talked about um, the impacts on weather and climate, global climate. Uh, suffice it to say, Al Gore, and I'll just move on because I'm, I'm doing the broad brush. Um, uh, desertification. Well, there's a lot of climatic change. If we lose um, productivity due to um, desert. Uh, and places that might have previously been productive. That's a, that's a consequence that's, I think, obviously part of global climate change, but it's, it's at such a mega scale that I, I broke it out. And then finally, uh, part of the reason that uh, I think we're, we're seeing such a uh, challenge as uh, a world community of six or however many billion we are is along with that fantastic population growth, so also, we have had fantastically rapid social change, political change, economic change, and I, I think that's all woven into what we're seeing in the Middle East, what we're seeing in Asia. Uh, it's, uh, it's obviously wrenching for our society. Each generation has got a virtual identity. Uh, uh, and uh, if I'm a boomer and my wife points out that her son is a Gen Xer and her daughter is a millennial, uh, the people in the room uh, may be of, of the boomer generation and we may have others represented. Uh, we all have different takes and that's in a society that's considered 
uh, advanced, uh, imagine how wrenching it is to, to move forward as we've seen in the Middle East. So I'll touch base on, if the computer will just allow us to, to use it instead of talk to it. Um, they, I'll, I'll touch on uh, some of the options uh, we have to, to react. Uh, go ahead, please. Um, got a handful here. Uh, this isn't exclusive because um, my, my realm is usually to talk about uh, renewable energy, specifically wind. Um, I pretty well uh, assembled the, the set of talking points for you. So if something's missing, that just means that you've got something else that belongs on the list uh, or that in the process of fitting it on one slide, I, I went for general categories and I'm going to let you, I'm going to assume that you you can infer some of the details, but many of the details, uh, folks like Monica and, and Wynn and Jay and others uh, here are, uh, I know, are knowledgeable about uh, getting the same kind of consciousness and knowledge uh, across the nation, uh, across the globe, is a, is a challenge that, um, well, I wish there were more people who could fill out the outline. Um, now, improving the efficiency of electric generation, I think, is a huge, huge opportunity. Uh, 33, 35 percent of the energy going in coming out as electricity is about right for coal systems. It may be better for some of the natural gas-fired modern uh, combined cycle turbines. But it's basically a system that says the fuel is really inexpensive. And uh, a little bit over a dollar or a million BTUs, that, that's a pretty, pretty modest price. Uh, hold on just a sec. It, it occurs to me that before the, the chaos of breaking up starts, I should have these passed out. It's basically, I'll accept the title slide, the very same things I'm going through. So if, if somebody could just see to it that they get to each of the tables. Um, not a lot of depth, but uh, uh, at least an outline. Uh, improved end user efficiency. There's phenomenal opportunities for us to do the same things we do and use much less fuel, uh, much less energy, um, have uh, smaller or more efficient cars, uh, lights that uh, give off light instead of a lot of heat and some light, uh, compact fluorescents around the perimeter, and I'm guessing by the color that these probably are over us, but that's not the case uh, in all the conference rooms in America. Um, a lot of times we, we talk about energy as if Everything can be solved um, by the very convenient issues of um, more efficient and renewables and it'll all be okay. Well, that would, those are big opportunities, but I think that we have even bigger opportunities to just do less. Um, we, we're a society that's adapted to the fact that energy is really cheap, and so we do a lot of things that are really energy intensive. And that we get a lot of benefit from it, we have to keep in mind. That's why it's important. If we didn't have a lot of benefit from it, living without it, no big deal. But uh, I think that we could, uh, we could probably live, if you will, smaller lives or a smaller footprint. But we've got you know, 70, 80 years of spreading our society out, which now has to be fed by an automobile or some other rubber-tired vehicle. It may take an equal period of time to contract our cities if the cost of fuel goes high enough to say, I care that it costs $5 a gallon. I care that it, um, it's damaging the planet. Um, and uh, we probably should be caring that it's uh, exporting our wealth. Uh, it seems like that's getting lost in the equation. Carbon capture and storage, uh, it's a technologically possible method. It's not commonly done yet. But um, we're going to hear a lot more about it in the next decade. Uh, power plants that aren't designed with the uh, intention to capture the carbon, uh, it's very expensive to capture it. Ones that are designed from the beginning to not mix a lot of air with the fuel, uh, it, it's much easier to capture the carbon. But that's not a common method. It's more expensive up front. Integrated uh, gasification uh, is, is one of those kind of categories. And then the carbon dioxide can be chilled and, and set aside, injected back into the earth, just like our, the oil or petroleum was that we took out. And then, of course, <clears throat> because we're a technologically uh, advanced society, and uh, very often 
things happen just when we need them or we at least assume that they will happen. I, I don't know that our society could be where it is if it didn't assume that it will be saved by the aha. And so I, I acknowledge the at least psychologically dominant feature and I hope for the, for the generations ahead uh, that there are some big, big ahas because the problems are uh, of, of many decades in creation. It, they will take many decades to harness and we need some really big ahas during those decades. Uh, that's my program and I'm open for questions. Yes, sir. No, I'm not knowledgeable. Um, I can offer you the scan, but I, I have no um, I have no expertise in that. Just general reading. I gave you an outline, and and that's that's outside my knowledge area. Um, you mean instead of your expertise in um, uh, wind energy? Yeah, that's dangerous because I'm more knowledgeable in wind, but I don't I'm not an expert. Okay, but I. I, I, I've, I've read about it, so, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the question is, um, I'm from Colorado, and now here in Missouri, we're setting up wind farms. Uh, wouldn't it be more expedient to put local wind generators in some of the areas that we're reaching as opposed to the, uh, creating a, a source of energy that requires more power lines, more overhead lines, those kinds of things? Uh, good question. Uh, Good opportunity for me to put my uh, my wind guy hat on. Um, the uh, uh, the wind resource is so much different uh, in Northwest Missouri than in uh, it is in Central Missouri that to try and capture an, a like amount of energy here uh, would be economically prohibitive, given what people are uh, even multiples of what people are accustomed to paying. Uh, the, the wind resource, uh, basically as the wind speed doubles, the energy present goes up by a factor of eight. And uh, the wind resource improves drastically as it gets higher above ground. And in order to get it just to the economic break point, as opposed to, um, you know, it's, a, it's an obvious choice, they, they had to go to the best part of the state, pick the places where the roads and the transmission grid were already favorable, minimum investment needed, and they still had to go 300 feet off the ground. And uh, for those same machines to be parked uh, in mid-Missouri, they would probably get one-tenth the energy that they're exposed to there. Um, at, a, at 300 feet, it might be 30 percent, but they, uh, uh, it, it's definitely a case of resource and location. Monica? Um, I've, I got involved in the wind issues <clears throat> about five years ago, and I expected at that point that we would find that the wind, the, the, that uh, new wind mapping projects may show that there's something in Missouri, but that it would really probably be something to be gener uh, developed during my daughter's generation instead of my own. I am beyond um, delighted to see that it got to, to uh, economically viable anywhere that the technology may get to that point where uh, people would choose to, I think it's going to be fundamentally a um, lifestyle or energy reliability question because the economics are, are going to really drive that if your machine isn't where the energy is, you can't capture it. And the energy, the energy is where the wind is faster. Yes. Tidal? Okay, okay, tidal turbines. Um, being a Midwesterner, <clears throat> until, uh, I'm sorry? Okay, I'll repeat the question. Um, uh, Kevin was asking uh, about generators driven by the tides, and I, uh, I thought it was T-I-T-L-E. Uh, the uh, tidal generation, that uh, hasn't been an important issue in the uh, mid-continent, but uh, if we could crank up the technology by Sunday, maybe we would have an opportunity. Uh, so my knowledge on that is real thin. Uh, I, I know there are some projects that are um, 
uh, exploring it, but I haven't heard of uh, massive projects. I think one of the reasons that wind is going ahead where things like tides and biomass are having trouble isn't that the others can't work on an economic scale, is that they take so many site-specific determinations, whereas the parameters for a wind project to work are fairly more comprehensible. They, they don't take an endless site-specific evaluation. And uh, if the wind is right, uh, they can identify that fairly readily, and then they know what to do. Well, I think this is the mule skinners, so there's only one answer that's allowed uh, according to the dominant, uh, <coughs> dominant uh, mid-continent. So um, I, I don't have any opinion on that topic because I'm not allowed to. Uh, and, and by the way, um, ethanol is a really good way to, um, to keep the farmers employed. Ma'am. Ma'am in the back. Did you have a question? Okay, right, right now the uh, design of a plant is largely optimized for fuel that is inexpensive. So they, they aren't optimizing to uh, recover uh, the maximum um, energy out of it. They're, they're capturing as much energy as is cost effective. And if you say, well, let's take a look at coal as something that we're going to capture more of the energy that's present and we want to do carbon capture, if they heat it in a what they call integrated gasification, they, they have a, a fuel that they can burn quite cleanly. Uh, they don't have huge amounts of air going with it, diluting its, its thermal. And then the uh, toxins are much less diverse. They can be captured. The carbon dioxide can be captured and uh, more of the energy, innate energy, uh, can be put to work. Uh, I'm not going to say there, there's an obvious path, but it's like most projects, if it becomes a goal, it becomes a sustained focus, uh, the chances to improve the efficiency of generation can go up from what's, what's basically a technology based on inexpensive fuel. I think I need to take a pass. I, I don't have a particular knowledge there. What are your thoughts on nuclear? Uh, nuclear uh, is uh, a technology that uh, involves transformation of energy into electricity. Next question. <laughs> Ma'am? Uh, Texas uh, in 98 had no wind farms. Texas is the nation's number one wind farm state in the nation. Uh, and West Texas apparently is even more so than the Panhandle. Well, one of the challenges that, uh, that the Plains state from, well, Western Kansas up through the Dakotas uh, face is they have fantastic wind resource. Uh, people have referred to the Dakotas as the, as the Saudi Arabia of wind. But without massive transmission lines and multi-billion dollars to, to get it to the, to the uh, customers, that you can put up a project that could be cost effective so long as the grid was there. And the grid could do it cost effectively so long as it knew it had something to carry. And so whereas most wind farms are done at uh, 100 or several hundred megawatts, which would translate into similar numbers of dollars, but maybe you know, a factor of one and a half, to do the transmission lines where there's, there's not a lot of uh, existing transmission or to beef it up is multi-billion, and so it takes some huge partnerships, and there's been so much uncertainty in the, in the world of transmission policy. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has been uh, really plowing new ground in the last decade w due to electric restructuring that we've heard in many states. 
and how transmission is handled and who gets to return on their dollar is so complex that it's, um, it's essentially a bottleneck on the issue of mega wind in the, in the plain states. Wind Caldwell. Okay, um, uh, in a nutshell, the, as you go further north and further west, by and large, for the high ground uh, that's not obstructed by trees, you typically encounter better wind resources. As you converge the trends of north and west, northwest has more of the sites that qualify as better. Uh, there's an awful lot of uh, spots throughout the northern and western part of the state, but the large tracts, it's kind of like a, a shotgun uh, pattern, it, it's pretty focused in that area. Um, regarding the, uh, the wind research, probably more germane than the, the 20 meter towers, which we've been loaning to landowners who are interested in small wind, is the work that the University of Missouri Columbia is doing on behalf uh, of, uh, well, all state interests, but with the, the assistance of, and uh, uh, well, the funding of the utilities is it's about a third of a million dollar study where they're placing instruments on 10 different existing communication towers. And these sensors are at much higher levels than traditionally wind has been monitored at, with some sensors in excess of 100 meters. And the, the turbines in, in uh, northwest Missouri are 85. So we're starting to get, you know, not just projected readings, but empirical readings from where those machines would be operating. That is information that will be invaluable for the next generation of wind development. And the nine of the ten, well, eight of the ten towers are instrumented now. The other two will be instrumented hopefully within the next six weeks and over the next year plus, depending on how we can line up ongoing financing, it'll become a multi-year data set. And I think I'm about 30 seconds. I've got, I got one more question. Turn of the century being uh, 2000. Okay, uh, I, I, I tend to root myself back in the 1900s with that term. Yeah, um, the, the cost of turbines was pretty flat until about 2005. Uh, they there was uh, such a push for each of them to get market share. They were bleeding themselves, and at the same time, uh, they had to stop that because well, they could have market share, but if they didn't have profit, they couldn't exist. They needed to catch up on that, and with the production tax credits renewal in 2005, instead of it being an indeterminate period, the, we moved into a new boom cycle, and that, that boom cycle now will continue through the end of 08. And since the beginning of 05, the cost of turbines has gone up about 50 to 60 percent. So instead of about a dollar per watt of capacity, it's about a dollar fifty, dollar sixty. So a one million dollar, I mean a one megawatt turbine would be in the realm of one and a half million or 1.6 million dollars. So they're very, very capital intensive, but their fuel bill is really good. <laughs>